Hey everybody, Dan and Andy here. Just wanted to let you know our special guest on this week's fish is none other than old friend of the podcast, your friend of mine, Alex Bell. That's right, Alex has returned. I mean, he hasn't been on for ages, but he has been there in the background the whole time. Anytime you hear a song or a noise. Shadowy, the spider master. But now he's back, he's funnier than ever. We can't wait for you to hear it. He's brilliant. Uh, It's going to be great. So now, I guess with no further ado, let's get on with the only podcast any of us has ever made or will ever make. Right, Dan? Ah, actually... I've got a bit of news. What? Yeah, I don't want this to be a shock, but I've I've actually launched a new podcast. All right, what's it called? It's called We Can Be Weirdos. Oh, I see. And, what, uh, and I guess it's, uh, it's just about solid facts, though, right? It's about stuff with a strong evidential base? Well, let's ignore that question quickly and focus on what the show is about. <laughs> so it's a weekly show where I sit down with someone remarkable and I try and find out all the weird stuff that they believe in and all the weird stuff they do in their life. So it features everyone from British museum curators like Irving Finkel, who told me stuff about how he sits on buses and stares at the back of people's head trying to make them turn around. It's got uh, Bexie Cameron, who used to be a part of the Children of God cult, but who escaped and wrote a fascinating memoir about it. There's Steve Feltham, who is the Guinness World Record for the longest continuous search for the Loch Ness Monster. Dan Aykroyd is coming on. There's so many amazing guests, and uh, it's a weekly show where I ask them to tell me about every single weird belief that they have. That's right. And guys, we, 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 the rest of us, know how hard Dan's been working on this. It sounds absolutely great. It's called We Can Be Weirdos. Give it a go wherever you get your podcast now. And we should say it's all based on Dan's book, The Theory of Everything Else, which is out now in the UK in paperback, and it's out in North America on the 27th of June. Louis Theroux himself has called it totally compelling and utterly bizarre. That's right. So it would mean the world to me if you all fish listeners would subscribe to it, follow it, give it a listen, and also pick up a copy of my book. And uh, go, okay, Dan. okay, okay, back to the actual good podcast. Here we go. On with the show. On with the podcast. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast coming to you from the QI offices in Hoburn. My name is Dan Schreiber, I am sitting here with Andrew Hunter-Murray, James Harkin and Alex Bell and once again we have gathered round the microphones with our four favourite facts from the last seven days and in no particular order, here we go. Starting with fact number one and that is Alex. My fact this week is that when the founder of the budget supermarket chain Aldi was kidnapped in the 1970s, he successfully negotiated a discount off his own ransom. (laughs) Brilliant. Did he claim that he was going off? And that as a result, (laughs) he had a yellow sticker on him. Brilliant. That would be such a good idea. Um, So this guy is called uh, Theo Albrecht. He founded Aldi with his brother, Carl. And they've got quite an interesting story in in how they um, founded the supermarket. But um, in the 1970s, 1970s when he was one of the richest people in the world um he was kidnapped at gunpoint by a convicted burglar called paul cron diamond nickname paul. was diamond yeah, yeah. <laughs> um and his crooked lawyer apparently who had gambling debts called oh. heinz Joachim Ollenberg. Whackim. Whackim. <laughs> Whackim Diamond Pole. Sort of home Alone Wet Bandits kind of duo. Um, oh, yeah. And um, yeah, they kidnapped him for 17 days um, and held him in an office. Apparently his... What, a cupboard, wasn't he? Yeah, he was, was in, in a cupboard. He was in a cupboard. And apparently his... But his appearance was so nondescript um, and he, he sort of wore quite kind of cheap suits because he was as um, money-pinching as his discount supermarket reputation mm. suggests. They had to ask him for ID to check that they definitely kidnapped a billionaire. The thing was that he didn't do any interviews, did he? or anything like mm. that right he was really not very well known at the time yeah. i read a U- u.s newspaper article from the week when he got kidnapped and they described him as west germany's least known millionaire yeah wow. so you know no one knew what he looked like he yeah was just a name so he was kept for 17 days he negotiates a cheaper ransom yeah. and they agree to it a bishop comes and delivers it the bishop of essen yeah which is the city that they were from yeah i guess it's where they lived at the time but i didn't realize that was a bishop's responsibility to he mediated to do, yeah <laughs> yeah i mean what a call to get as the bishop you must yeah. never get that no but then yeah. he, he was didn't he isn't he the one who left the money the, yes. the actual yeah he like, did the handover he, he, yeah, yeah exactly yeah, yeah. yeah. but yeah. then and I think um, Albrecht stayed with him for 24 hours afterwards stayed with the bishop why because the police were kept out of it completely 
wow. um, because the family didn't want the police involved because they thought he might be in danger. Right. And the uh, kidnappers said they wanted a 24 hour period to get away. Oh, okay. And so they said, okay, well, he'll stay with the bishop for 24 hours. Yeah. And then after that time, we'll let him go and he'll tell the police who who he's seen and wow. stuff. Okay, right. so he gets out, the bishop, they get these 24 hours and- oh, yeah. They do, they catch them as well. And they, they catch they them, catch yeah, them that's right. And they only get half the money back. And, yeah. and to the dying day of the two guys, they never recovered said, the yeah. missing 3.5 million. And the... they died within a month of each other. How weird is that? Because they were yeah. about 20 years difference in age. That's so romantic. No, was within a, no. within a, yeah. <laughs> six <laughs> years, I think. Within a decade, yeah, six, yeah. Oh, yep. One you was 87, right. the other was 93. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But no, um, so after he gets let out, Theo uh, is goes even more recluse. He goes into total lockdown. No photographs are going to be taken of him evermore. He is, in, every time he gets into a car, it's an armored car, a different route every single day when he's going into his office. If he's staying somewhere, he goes and he finds the exits immediately. So it's obviously mm. yeah. left no, huge, huge trauma yeah, on yeah, him, yeah, uh, really, this experience. Yeah. But he no, also, I, sorry. sorry, I know one thing that will make you interested in him, especially Dan, yeah. which is that Forbes described the brothers, the Albrecht brothers, Theo and Carl, who co-founded Aldi, described them as more elusive than the Yeti. Ooh. <laughs> I'm pretty sure like the Yeti, Yeti doesn't have like a, An like a, business, car. a business trail, like a paper trail. <laughs> like, he's not registered with company's house. <laughs> <laughs> also, I mean, that doesn't make me more interested. If he was a Yeti hunter, that's interesting. Okay, okay, yeah, Just okay. saying the word Yeti in a sentence doesn't immediately you've got, you've mean... You've got a higher threshold for interesting. I do. Okay, okay. I think my favorite bit of this whole story was that after the whole ordeal, um, Albrecht went to court to try and claim the money that was paid as the ransom um, as a tax deductible business expense, oh, which is brilliant. He, I don't think he was successful, but like, was he that's so cool. And I like, think you see. can still do that, certainly in some places. If you have a good accountant, because yeah. I think it's in America, it's been in done. In America for sure, mm. yeah. Um, Famously Getty. I guess John Paul a, Getty, it is a business expense, isn't it? Yeah, well, well, or is it? If yeah. the person who is abducted is the CEO of the company, then it's to do with the company. I think that's the argument. Um, his brother, Carl, stumped up a lot of money for that as well, mm. the ransom. Uh, okay. He was part of it. Um, but yeah, I love how much the Ulbricht brothers were really sort of stingy with their they're, cash. They're brilliant. I think Theo was the one who uh, they used to approve all the designs for all the shops. Um, and um, there was one where he was given the plans and he said, the plans are fine, but the paper you've printed it on is too thick. Yeah, Print really it on yeah. thinner, cheaper paper. Yeah. 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 He used to he used to famously use pencils right down to the end. Like when you see people with the pencil meets the rubber, he would be yeah. using pencils like that. And if he walked into the office of the Aldi offices yeah. and he saw that the lights were on, but he could see that you could see in a room without the lights, he'd go around turning off all the lights. It's so screwed yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I did read one article that said um, he and his brother were the first people to ever turn off a lights in the room because they were worried that they were wasting electricity <laughs> what a thing to invent yeah that's right i, I, I was thinking like being the a timing. Dad. yeah exactly he invented being a dad yeah the timing almost works that's really funny i think the the story is very interesting because they founded it together didn't they they yeah. founded Aldi together yeah their and mother mother ran a shop like i mean like so they took over yeah. the shop as part of their journey but she was the one yeah. who really started there I think she deserves a little bit of credit. Yeah, you're right. That's a good point. And then actually they were dragooned into helping their mum because their father, he'd been a coal miner and he got emphysema, so he couldn't really work. So they had to support the family. But anyway, they fell out over whether or not they should sell cigarettes in their shops. And I think Theo said we should, and Carl said we shouldn't. And I think it was for shoplifting reasons. Yeah. They, well, they oh. one, I think, yeah, they yeah. one thought that... that they, they didn't care about the health reasons. Yeah. So was it stinginess as yeah, well? Yeah, yeah. Despite like, their, their father having emphysema, they were, it was no. more about the deal. That's so interesting. Okay, and then they had this thing, the Aldi Equator. Yes, I'm sure you that, where they divided Germany top to bottom, <laughs> and north was... Uh, Theo's like not, not with any kind of wall, we should say. Like <laughs> So many people died crossing the Aldi equator. It's very <laughs> sad. People were desperately trying to get to those. Because they did. So know. this was in the, this was 1961, and they had about 300 Aldis all over the country, and that's what got split up between yeah. them. And if you look at the logos, they are different colors across the yeah. the Aldi equator. Yeah. And so they are definitely two different operations if, that are going ironically, on. Ironically, if you were kidnapped in Germany, you could use that to work out which half of the country you were in. Yes. <laughs> oh my God, yeah. <laughs> what, a great idea. Idea. <laughs> what a brilliant idea. There's still different companies now, aren't they? Mm. Um, Aldi Nord and Aldi Sud. Yeah, that's uh, right. And I think which ones do we have? We have 
Aldi no no, Britain, no we have Aldi Sud, Sud, don't Sud, we? Yeah, yeah. and in America they have them both but one of them is called Trader Joe's wow yeah that's what Trader Joe's is I never realized, yeah. Yeah. and Aldi itself is the name Aldi we said it's it's a poor mancha of Albrecht Discount Discount I was trying to remember what the German version was <laughs> his brother came up with that didn't they oh, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> Dis stingy cunt <laughs> 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 The two businesses were called Discord and Dacro, weren't they? <laughs> Imagine like big billboards with them kind of like, <laughs> like, over the border. <laughs> I'm yeah. with Discord. Short with Discord. Yeah. <laughs> I think they liked each other. I think they got on perfectly well. They just disagreed over I this. It was amicable. Yeah. I think the split was amicable. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I l- I've never read into Aldi before. I've been to Aldi many times. God damn it, I love it so much. I, I don't want to like treat this as an advert, but what an operation. <laughs> really? uh, just Well, okay, so for example, they don't stock as many items as a regular supermarket will, and they've never compromised on that. It's grown ever so slightly, but a, an average supermarket might have something like 200,000 different items, whereas they might have 2,000 items. It has grown since the earlier days when it came to Britain. But one of the things was everyone who was working there was required to memorize the price of every single item in the shop, so every 2,000 items, which meant that there was a thing that's known as Aldi panic, which is when you get to the checkout, the panic is, I can't pack my bags as quickly as they're running the stuff through the uh, till, yeah. oh, so you stressful. get a bit yeah. worried. And that's really yeah. common now, because they're so fast at scanning. Well, here's the thing, the reason they're so fast at scanning these days, because this is another Aldi innovation, is if you buy a product from any supermarket, you got a barcode, mm. you get there, the person's looking around for the barcode, if you look on Aldi products that are specifically Aldi, they print the barcode all over it so no matter where you turn the product it scans exactly and it's right through yeah because they also opened i think in the 50s the first self-service grocery store in germany Uh but by in that in those days self-service meant you go in and get stuff off the shelves and bring it to the checkout as opposed to giving your list to a clerk who were going to get it for you so that must be a huge efficiency yeah yeah and they brought in shopping trolleys and i think they were the first company to bring in the shopping trolleys where you had to put a coin in that's what that it says. Really? That's yeah. what they say, yeah. I read an article with um, the communications director at Aldi, and he said, we're always amazed by the pay-it-forward spirit that happens in our parking lots. And apparently they reckon that in Germany, at least, people will pay for the next person's trolley. trolley. Hmm. And I just, I've never seen that happen in my entire life in the UK. I go around checking to see if anyone's left a quid. <laughs> I, I could lose an hour or two sometimes <laughs> looking for a single, you know. Um, I literally only have one quid that I keep in my car for that thing. As I don't really use cash these days, yeah, right? Yeah, right. Do you keep it on a string? Because <laughs> <laughs> you're sounding a bit like Theodore Albrecht. <laughs> a bit like that gun. <laughs> they got big in Germany because they started looking at the models of what was happening in America with grocery stores. Ooh. And so there was a Memphis grocer uh, that was called Piggly Wiggly. Oh, Piggly yeah, Wiggly. Yeah. So it was Piggly Wiggly, Hoggly Woggly, and uh, Handy Andy was the oh, last yeah. one these were all of the like the things going on in america at the time and yeah, yeah so they became so piggly Germany's wiggly was famously the first place that would let you take things off the shelves and put them in your trolley yeah. and then pay for them afterwards exactly and i'm not sure if we said it here we might not have done but they basically people didn't want to do it because they felt like they were shoplifting mm. yeah, well i feel is. like that with the new amazon fresh stores when you walk in and sc- you scan yeah but you go and wearing a motorbike helmet don't you you don't, <laughs> you don't scan anything and you're shouting and holding a baseball bat yeah. <laughs> I actually um, was going to kidnap Jeff Bezos, but he just walked into my house, <laughs> into my cupboard. <laughs> Two weeks later, they put loads of money in my account. It was perfect. So when you go to Aldi, there's always, and I didn't realize this was a big thing, but in the middle of Aldi, there's always this weird aisle where it's yeah. just random stuff. Oh, it's like stuff. the room of requirement. It's sort of like re- every time it's different. It's, it's huge. so it's bizarre. Like, yeah, yeah. So in the middle aisle, and, and it's it's sort of famous amongst oh, yeah. online people. There's Twitter accounts where what random thing have you found it's in the huge. middle aisle? Yeah, it's massive. Um, yeah, so everything from motion-activated toilet bowl night lights, you know, it's just <laughs> randomly to um, traffic cones. Oh, why? why? It feels like sort of it fell off the back of the lorry kind of vibe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But which definitely is not the case. Sorry, they definitely didn't (laughs) do that, obviously. No, because I remember like you would always get like a flyer through the post 
and it would tell you what was going to be in the middle aisle in the next month or so. Oh, really? really? And you would know that there was going to be a canoe there, and you'd be like, oh, shit, we've got to get there on the <laughs> second one Tuesday. Canoe, well, they have only have a certain amount, yeah. and so if it was something really cool, everyone yeah. in the town would want wow. to get there as quickly as possible. And they never restock, it. ever, no, so it's no. just that. It's like a yeah. one-flash so sale. Exciting. It gets called the Isle of Shite. That's <laughs> yeah. very good. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah. One yeah. other thing on German kidnapping. Oh, yeah. I think German. Um, do you know about the Pied Piper of Hamelin? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Famously kidnapped all the children of Hamelin. I never thought of it that way. Ah. I thought he got rid of the rats and then the parents didn't pay him? Yeah, yeah, so then he did the same thing. He played his pipe and, and led them. He basically hypnotised children to come with him. So there's, oh, yeah. the, there's, an, there's a question of like consent, really. <laughs> yeah, it does sound like there is. Uh, there's it? no question. There was no consent. Like, oh, okay. basically, he, he took all the children out of the town because they didn't pay his bills. But he was okay. fictional. Well, there was um, an entry in Hamlin Town Records dating to 1384 that says that it is 100 years since our children left. Uh, and that fits in with the date of when people said this what? happened, which was in wow. 1284. Uh, and it supposedly happened on the 26th of June, the day of St. John and St. Paul. And the 130 children <laughs> in Hamlin disappeared. What and that's what the story's based on. Was there a day of St. George and St. Ringo as well? <laughs> <laughs> um, but we now have theories as to what the Pied Piper was. Um, so we think that possibly the Pied Piper story is a fictional account of something that actually happened. Mm. And the children did go missing missing and did get taken by someone right uh, can you guess what the actual job of the real life pied piper probably was oh okay um, um are we gonna is oh, this guessable uh, from school bus story? driver school that's bus good. That's, that's good. really good uh, i mean the, the dates don't quite work for oh, school buses okay. 1284 yeah, i've got it i've got it school cart driver swineherd swine oh, dresses the children up as pigs lovely. Really? Uh, but no that's not what okay oh, was he one of the says. wiggles then oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> aldi <laughs> trolley manager <laughs> lured them in with free trolleys well okay. according to most theories at the moment he could have been a recruitment consultant Okay. Pied Piper. <laughs> I so follow what? them in the street. I find it so <laughs> beguiling. These children are all now working at like Deloitte. <laughs> <laughs> there was an economic depression around that time, and a lot of the youth of various towns were taken out of German sort of villages and taken to the bigger areas oh. of Western Europe. Right. And they had locators or recruiters that would go around these towns and try and bring the youth out there to work in different places. Oh, wow. And so there's one possibility that the Pied Piper <laughs> story is based on a recruitment <laughs> consultant. Wow. <laughs> well, they all got sort of free mugs from like companies <laughs> that were <laughs> Came back later with those cool wireless phone yeah. headsets. <laughs> yeah. Pagers. Yeah. Stop the podcast! Stop the podcast! Hey everyone, this week's episode of Fish is sponsored by Canva. That is right. Canva is a design platform that makes it incredibly easy and pleasant and, in fact, joyful to create gorgeous visual content. Yeah, it's it's an amazing place, isn't it? Because actually, Andy, I remember you've actually used Canva, haven't you? I have. I'm really, really bad at, at, at thinking of, of what might look nice. And I, I went on to Canva. The templates are so easy. They're so simple to use. You can really bring things to life. There are lots of different kinds of templates that you can use and customize so you can make something that feels nice and personal. Genuinely did a bit of design and some friends said, oh, did you hire a professional designer? I'm not even joking. That happened. And I was able, and I said, no, it's Canva. That's right, it's Canva. And exactly what Andy's talking about, you too can experience that beauty. And you can do so many other things on it as well. You can use it for business docs. You can help get your party invitations designed. There are templates for websites. Uh, you got a mug that you want printed something cool on. Canva can do that for you. So head there, and if you want to give it a go yourself and feel the joy that Andy felt when he was able to present whatever it was that he showed to his friends, all you need to do is go to canva.me slash fish and you'll get a free 45-day extended trial. That's canva, C-A-N-V-A dot me, M-E slash fish for a free 45-day extended trial. Give it a go! Okay, on with the show. Open the podcast! It is time for fact number two, and that is Andy. My fact is that the world's largest collection of model trains doesn't fit on standard model train tracks. <laughs> I'm really pleased you added the word standard in there because there's a big discussion. Yeah, yeah we, had a, we had a big email chat about this. No, but I just got to say, Alex has got in front of him actual, like, this is the weirdest bit of research oh I've God. seen. Okay, I'm not going to go into it, don't worry. I'm going to say the 
basic fact and then we'll have the argument yeah this uh, by the way thank you to neil gibson who sent in this fact um who didn't realize the chaos he was unleashing in our <laughs> previously happy team um this is something that's uh, from the national rail museum in york uh, they have a collection of 610 model railway vehicles all made by the same man who was called james peel richards 1902 to 99 mm. and um he was incredibly devoted to detail and accuracy, and he thought he could get his models more accurate if he made them to a 33 millimeter gauge. So yeah. the gauge is the distance between the two train tracks, uh, and the, the normal gauge for model trains is 32 millimeters, yeah. and they're not compatible with the vast majority of model railway lines, and even the National Rail Museum don't have a layout where they can <laughs> put these trains on a train track. Yeah. So I just think it's very, it's a very sweet fact, I think. Can I, I don't want to make this fact even more contentious, but oh, I have a feeling it was 612, not 610. What did you guys read? Well, could also, you maybe forgive me for a fraction of rounding? <laughs> <laughs> the idea is a lot of these model trains you take anything that's one foot long and you make it seven millimeters long right. and you do the same for everything else in all the trains right <laughs> now if you do that then you get your gauge to be exactly 33 millimeters to a 0.01 right, okay. of a millimeter so it's pretty much 33 millimeters but historically they've always had 32 millimeter gauges and so all the other trains that you would have are slightly not exact so that's right. like the hornby standard for the example. hornby like standard nearly yeah. all the track you'll find is that width a lot of them yeah. it's called the o gauge but basically he decided well i want mine to be exactly right so i'm going to get this <laughs> one millimeter difference even though it won't be able to go on hardly any tracks wow. i'm going to make it because i want it to be perfect yeah he's a hero did he make his own <laughs> tracks he I must have right know. i think i think i think, think, think cuz I, I went there and i had an amazing Two, you, two days you, I stayed overnight seriously <laughs> <laughs> so was there a sleeper train uh, in the no, museum no, no, that would have been so great <laughs> Alex cramming one finger into the sleeper train <laughs> Um, no, um, because they have actual other stuff. They don't just have models. They have actual trains there and all sorts there. Um, no, it's an amazing. And I, I remember seeing them. They've got this fantastic, I think it's called an open archive, where um, they've got all this stuff that they can't, they don't really have room to sort of display in proper museum, just like thrown on the shelves oh, and wow. sort of display so you can see it. And I remember also seeing they've got scale models of Qu the Queen Victoria's royal train, which is all sort of entirely mm. um, plush inside with a, with a velvet um, uh, upholstered toilet and things like that. And in minutes. Yeah, 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 this is all miniature. Nice. When they were designing and building the trains, the actual full-on steam trains, they used to make scale models of the steam trains that are about, I'd say, a f like a foot wide and several feet long that were full-on working models to check that they worked and they were all kind of the right size. So they have these really st <laughs> stonking great models of like working steam trains. They've also got, you've mentioned it before on the podcast, there's a, a massive train set that was used to train the signal Mm. operators mm. Um, so it was the train cool. set but the yeah. fun of the train set was like all about the signals and not the trains so yeah. can I ask Alex did you see the entire collection of JP Richards's trains when you were there well, I don't know because I there's loads on the wall I remember them they're all stacked up on the You've wall you've seen them because they're so all there loads, but I don't know if I saw 610 but. what's really interesting is that JP Richards never saw the entire collection himself ah. uh, we think and that's because he always kept them in his home where most of them were in boxes so they were never all out at the same time mm. and when he donated them to the museum uh, he was really really sick it was just before he died he was oh. too ill to travel so when it was on display he never got to see it so oh, he actually so never saw his entire collection on display I'm really sad about oh. that because yeah, no, what a so hero sad. what a great guy I yeah. love it the collection is still growing but mm. uh, actually I should quickly say thank you to my friend Chris Valkoinen who yeah. is the associate archivist at the National Rail Museum uh, who sent me loads of stuff for this absolutely brilliant but wow. yeah the collection is still growing because a lot of his uh, wagons weren't quite finished when he okay. got there so he left them to other people to finish them because <laughs> he wanted the entirety of the train system of the London and North Western well, don't uh, we trains all, that's what we all want to see <laughs> wow. really, from between it? 1902 and 1944 so I he wanted it. everything yeah, that's um, and they models. weren't all exactly done at that time so some people are still doing them now they're still kind of making them better and better it is the most impressive thing when you see the detail that someone goes into to recreating an area because you make it's not these aren't things you buy from the shop mm. you create the buildings and you create and this is like when you're making a whole landscape so the tracks the trees the buildings around it um, I've only ever played with two model train sets before oh yeah and right. they belonged to Eddie Izzard 
So, <laughs> clang. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> trust you to have a celebrity train set anecdote. This is not, it's not what it sounds like. So every time I go to Bexhill on Sea, which is, uh, my family goes there a lot, I always take my boys to the Bexhill Museum. And inside is Eddie Izzard's childhood model train set that her father had built um, when Eddie's brother was born, started building it then. And then Eddie's mother got a bit ill and, and eventually huh. she passed away. And part of the project of keeping themselves busy from the sort of, you know, the horrible depression of it all was to continue building this train set so you can go and press buttons and it sends two trains around and it's where eddie's dad worked you can see the train he used to get into london uh and it shows all the buildings around and they've commissioned all of bexhill on sea as a train set as well eddie's kind of put money into that and you press buttons and it goes around it snows i love that it's It's incredible did you guys read about um simon george no very well done no simon george is a model railway fan uh, currently, currently modelling and, and making huge mm. sets. So in 2021, he had just made a model railway which was really big. It was 61 metres. And it was a model of a specific line from where he'd grown up in the 80s. It was the Calder Valley, lots of coal-fired trains. Mm-hmm. And it's one of Britain's biggest, if not the biggest, uh, model train yeah. set. Really impressive. He spent eight years working on it. Um, and he he met someone. He met uh, his girlfriend while he was making it. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, that is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> this is the thing. Well, wait a minute. Okay, yeah. come on. So he, he was interviewed about it. And he said, when I first met her, she didn't know I was building this. Mm. And what had happened was, it, it wasn't in his home, this train set he was building. He'd leased a mill because it had this enormous basement, <laughs> right? right? So, and he said, okay, she knew I leased a mill with a huge basement, Simon said. But I kind of led her to believe I was a wine merchant. <laughs> <laughs> Because that sounded cooler than building a model railway. <laughs> I'm just imagining the discussion that he had when he said, now, we've been getting on very well. I think there could be something here. I need to tell you that the basement in the mill, <laughs> I've not let you go in. It's not a wine collection. <laughs> what must she have thought? Yeah. She turned up unannounced at his work one day. She wanted to surprise him. And she turned up to his wine merchant oh business God. to find him in what a huge do? model railway. Don't come in, I'm wanking. <laughs> 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 there, are bodies, I... there are loads of bodies down here. Yeah, yeah. This is where I keep a family locked up. Come on. <laughs> he said she wondered where all the wine was, but actually she really appreciated the detail and the artistic element. Very, very cool. Um, Hermann Goering, the the Nazi, is also well, who's, enthusiastic. Who's yeah. Hermann Goering, not the Nazi? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just in case there are any others out there. Um, he was an enthusiastic no. model. Yeah, Nazis love trains. They love models, obviously. You know that famous big Third Reich one. But um, I No, sorry. I d- again, Alex, you you spent two days sorry, at the National Railway Museum. It's you know, nothing what? to do with train models. No, no, sorry. The, that, that's a totally, totally off topic. But um, Did they have a the big model? Hitler commissioned a huge model of what the centre of Berlin was going to look like. Oh. And it's a really horrible, scary model that still exists. You can go see it. Okay. Right, um, and it's, okay. it's really wow. bizarre and interesting. But like, I think it, that but whole element go- of control from yeah, afar, yeah. like you know, the kind of go- a, you're saying Goering anyway, did the Goering trains. Had two, yeah. He had two train sets, um, just like Eddie Izzard. Uh, one in the <laughs> no, just like sorry, <laughs> you, you've seen train. Wait, that you've seen said you've seen two train sets in your life. No, played with it twice. Played, played, played with, with it twice. Okay. Both of Eddie's. Yeah. Right. Sorry. Okay. So he had um, <laughs> Goering had one train set in his attic <laughs> and one in his basement. Oh yeah. Um, okay. And um, there are pictures of it, and they're really it's pretty extensive. Is he you know lived lived in a big old Nazi house and had a huge attic and a right, massive basement. Yeah. Um, and there's there's a rumor that you can sort of maybe see evidence for in the pictures that um, there, there was there were wires where, that went over the one in the attic um, that planes went across and you could drop little bombs after the planes. To bomb okay, them, right. Which is wow, well, good fun. Wow, they mm. originated in Germany, didn't they? Model railways, basically. Uh, there was a company called Marklin. And they'd be making toys and stuff, but they mostly made dolls' houses. Mm. The idea is you make a doll's house and you sell them the house, and then <clears throat> they have to buy the dolls to go inside, and they have to buy the cookers, and they have to buy the chairs, and they have to buy all the bits and pieces. Mm-hmm. And they wanted something that boys would like. How, which... are, the, how are the dolls going to get to work? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they just wow. thought, well, by doing the railways, then we can sell the railway mm. tracks, but then we can sell the <clears throat> stock, and we can sell the yeah. little bushes that go on. I don't know. I've never yeah, played yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's another German connection, which is maybe the earliest ever <clears throat> model train belonged to the poet Goethe. Did oh, it? So this is Clang so yourself, mate. <laughs> <laughs> this is from 1829. It's six years before Germany had even a railway, a okay. steam railway of its own. Wow. Some English well wishers gave him a tiny, tiny model of Stevenson's rocket, the earliest steam yeah. railway engine. I think the earliest steam railway engine. Um, and um, it came with a set of wagons and rails, and Goethe put it on his desk. I think he might have um, given it to his uh, granddaughter at the time because he, he was an old man by that point. Yeah, um, cool. Wow. Yeah. wow. 
you want to hear an incredibly well so okay here's a fact about model railways i'm just going to tell right. you what Okay. That's what we're all here for. Okay. <laughs> what a change of topic. <laughs> I know what's about to happen. So, you know how you use different things to represent. So, you might use a coffee stirrer as a piece of fencing. Yeah. yeah. Like big, th like things from our world. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. I see. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you could use a marble as a boulder, for instance. Perfect. Mm, yeah, you yeah. paint it or whatever. Yeah, and you, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. So, do you know what they use to make coal? Okay. So, it's got to be something that. It looks like coal, yep. but is much smaller. Yeah. Hmm. Um, but maybe it's not the same colour, but you could paint it black. Right. Is it not just small bits of coal? They use coal. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. They, they hit it with a hammer and grind it up small. What? <laughs> no. Well, it's, what? Definitely, it's definitely a fact. <laughs> it's What's just it? by any chance the fact that you messaged us saying, I just told my wife a fact, and she said that's the dullest thing you've ever said in your life. That's the fact. She just said, stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> I found it so interesting. And it's so boring. She took off her I would discontinue. <laughs> Amazing, Andy. Great fact. Thank Great you. fact. Thank you. Yeah. Do you know the really tragic thing? What? We last talked about model railways four years ago. I looked through my notes for that show. It was in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, the, probably the most famous model railways in the world Ooh. have to be... The ones that we see in Thomas the Tank Engine. Oh, yeah. Thomas yeah. the Tank Engine. That's, I mean, that's globally yeah, the yeah, biggest, yeah. most famous. And um, just, a, just a cool connection. We, uh, so there is a famously the Fat Controller, who's now been renamed Sir Topham Hat. Mm -hmm. uh, he was, he was all, sorry, just so he was always yeah, called his real name. Yeah, always, yeah but they kind of phased out the Fat Controller. He's in the cartoons. Right. He's back to Sir Topham Hat, and. Um, we know someone who was the real life Sir Topham Hat. Stop it. No. Yeah. What Four do you mean that's here. in the voice? Or? No, so they used to have offices for Thomas the Tank Engine. When children wrote in, they had an official Sir Topham Hat who would write letters back to the children. Mm. And, and we know that person. Okay. And they've been on fish. Back? They've been on is fish. It Mitch? Is it Craig Glende? Yes. Craig Glende, editor in chief for the Guinness World Amazing. Records. Wow. Okay, that's bizarre. Yeah. When I was tiny. I wrote to Sir Topham Hat, and no. I got and I got a letter back. Did wow. you? Oh, yeah. It's just small coal. <laughs> <laughs> You're a really annoying child. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it is time for fact number three, and that is James. Okay, my fact this week is that in 1760, a book was publicly burned in Switzerland because it claimed that William Tell did not exist. Fair, Fair game. Yeah. Because uh, I, I sort of think he did. I sort oh, of you're think wrong. he did. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Is it, well, publicly burn me then. Because I... <laughs> Is it like the Pied Piper and he was just like a management consultant? No. <laughs> yeah. He's less historical than the Pied Piper, I would say. Um, he was part of the foundation myth of the country of Switzerland, basically. Yeah. He's kind of Robin Hood-esque, right? Yeah, like, and arrows he is. To to power. You're spot on, you know, shot an apple off his son's head to... That's the only thing I know. It's the only thing... Like, shot an apple off his mm. son's head. I don't. I didn't know any of the context. I just knew... Yeah. I, n I never questioned it It was either. quite contrived. Like, for some reason, he ended up in a situation where they were like, <laughs> shoot it or we'll kill you and your son. And then he did it. And then they were like... Well, okay. hang on a second. Why? How, co how come you've got two arrows then? And he was like, well, if I accidentally killed my son, I was going to shoot you. It was, yeah. quite, it was quite cool, wasn't it? Because the reason this whole thing started was he was going through this town, um, uh, which was called Altdorf. Uh, and he was there's a guy there who was a bailiff called Gessler and Gessler had had this thing where he put a hat on a pole and it was in the center of the town and if you walked past the pole and you had a hat on you had to sort of take your hat off and be like hello pole and <laughs> so <laughs> we should, I think we should say the pole represented the immensely powerful Habsburg Empire <laughs> <laughs> it's still weird it's still weird so he goes past doesn't take his hat off I guess Gessler who just happens to be monitoring every person <laughs> yeah. passing by sees that says hey take your hat off he says no and then that's where this thing happens where he says you need to now shoot your son or rather, shoot the apple. Shoot the apple. <laughs> yeah. He says, you got to put your son, you got to put an apple on his head, and you got to shoot through it. And if you get it, then you guys can go free. If you miss, then I'm going to kill you as well. So it was a kind of big challenge. A perfectly yeah. fair 
challenge punishment that fits the crime it doesn't make any sense <laughs> of course, but it makes sense for someone who's put a hat on a pole and made you to <laughs> so, yeah. it could That's... he choose the apple though could he choose a very large apple like a pink lady <gasps> like the yeah. one i saw in me <laughs> by any car.com that time <laughs> honestly i could have hit that How for would you yards. i know you've stopped listening alex but james has an anecdote about this very very big apple he once saw it's actually it's really weird to get bored on a podcast that you're on <laughs> that you're not even listening to <laughs> no, but if it had been that apple yeah you're yeah right. it'd be easy anyway yeah. look like Dan said and Alex said this is the story and then because he did the Apple thing they said okay fine Switzerland could exist and he became like the foundation <laughs> myth of this country so everyone believed it and thought that he was a real character and then there was a historian called Egidius Chudi and he found out that actually the earliest writing of it was 250 years after the events and then they found the original Oath of Rutli uh, which was for the foundation of Switzerland, uh, for the early cantons all getting together, and it named the three representatives, and none of them was called Tell. None of them was called William Tell, and so, and actually, they got the date wrong as well in the original sort of um, <laughs> the original story. And so, this guy called De Halle wrote a book called William Tell, a Danish Fable, and everyone in Switzerland oh. thought this was outrageous that he could put this in writing, and the book was publicly burned in Altdorf Square. Was was he a Swiss author himself. He was Swiss, yeah. It's, and I, because I, I sort of vaguely thought of William Tell as a bit Robin Hoodish, as in someone who might have existed, mm. but not really. Yeah. I didn't really think, oh, that's, see, that doesn't seem like a very significant thing to me. But I read a piece about, it's from The Atlantic, but it's from 1890. And it's just this line To understand the commotion produced in Switzerland by Cops Expose, we must try to imagine what would be the result in the United States if George Washington was suddenly declared to be a legendary character. Yeah, mm. it's, it's a, a bit of huge, that. Yeah, yeah, wow. huge moment to find out. It was a bit of that. And then what happened was everyone was like, De Halle, what are you doing? This is ridiculous. <laughs> and so he said, Oh, no, no, no. This was a literary exercise. I was just, it was just an essay I was writing to see if I could. It was like, <laughs> Like, you know, it's like coming up with two reasons whether we should leave the EU or not leave the EU. And this was the one I decided to go with. It wasn't supposed to be taken seriously. This is the first, like, dude, it's a social experiment. Like, yeah. you see, it, 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 it sounds like he was petrified. Like, it sounds, oh, yeah. it sounds like had he not renounced that, it could have been like a Salman Rushdie kind of situation where he might have gone into a, you know, hiding yeah. in a cupboard kind they of thing. They were absolutely furious. Yeah. But then obviously he'd opened the floodgates and suddenly all the skeptics came in, like skeptics do, and said, well, actually, there was no organized uprising after all. And there's no evidence that anyone called William Tell had lived, let alone <clears throat> shot an apple off anyone's head. And they concluded that he was probably a fictional character, possibly based on a little bit of, you know, real yeah. life stuff. And then someone found this old story from the um, Danish sagas, which is basically the entire story. And that was written, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years before William Tell was supposed to have even existed. And so it seems like they've taken an old story from the sagas and they've kind of appropriated it. It was um, it was a story of Harold Bluetooth. Mm. Yeah. Inventor of yeah, wireless yeah. technology. Yes. Yes. Certainly the namesake <laughs> of it. Guy. Danish king of the 10th century. Yeah, yeah. And it is, like, I looked at it and it's, it's identical. It is the same story. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, there was a play. Schiller Schiller's play yeah and then the play became an opera by Rossini and it's just it's such an international thing so it, it's an opera about a Swiss hero by an Italian composer Rossini based on a play by a German writer Schiller which premiered in Paris brilliant as in it's all of Europe is involved in the, this uh... and you know the, but you know the famous William Tell overture the Rossini didn't actually write that for the William Tell opera get out he was like running out of time when he was writing the William Tell opera. So, so, <laughs> That's yeah. not how it works when you're running out of time writing music. When well, no, it speeds up. No, 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 he, just, <laughs> um, no he, uh, he he was running out of time to finish the entire opera um, and didn't have an overture ready. So he went and borrowed a pre-existing uh, oh. piece from one of his uh, earlier operas, which was called Elizabeth, Queen of England. So that was written almost uh, wow. 15 years beforehand. How interesting, because everything I can think of about Elizabeth, the Queen of England, none of the events in her life fit in with that music. No, it doesn't really work, does it? Yeah. You know no. I mean? Like, no. you can't imagine Sir Walter Raleigh laying down his cloak and her going, da -da 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 -da. No. Yeah, no. But, well, the opera was only performed in full three times. And yeah. then, because it was five hours long. Oh my God. <laughs> five hours? It was Is that average time for an opera? No. no, really? That's very long. Is Definitely okay. a, more than a few hours is fine, hmm. but five hours is pretty yeah, long. Okay. Th even three years. I've never been to one. I just always know Especially that. Especially given that some of the music was so fast, like you would have thought mm. the music would be slower if he was going to drag it out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a Hermann Göring link. I can't oh, yeah. believe there's another Hermann Göring link in this podcast. <laughs> Uh, the Nazi Which Hermann Goering, by the way? <laughs> sorry. The Nazi sorry. one. Nazi okay, Goering. sorry, good. Just good to clarify. 
Um, the Nazi regime made a movie of William Tell. Okay. Uh, but, and they treated the Tell story as a, a kind of Nazi myth. Because at that point, well, I think it was before the war, they claimed they were liberating ethnic Germans living in other countries mm-hmm. who'd been oppressed by those countries. Uh, and Hermann Goering's mistress was cast in a leading role. Yeah, okay, yeah. right. That was based on Schiller's play, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, but then Hitler banned it later on yeah. uh, because there was an assassination attempt on him by a guy called Maurice Baveau, who was known as the new William Tell. Yeah. Oh. And he thought, well, it, I better get rid of all other William Tells. Yeah. He was Swiss as well. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've I've been in Switzerland for Swiss Independence Day on the first of August. Oh uh, yeah, which is when what they have happened? a lot of uh, sort of fireworks and uh, oh, yeah. stuff like that. It's just, yeah, it's yeah, relatively really. low key. Lots of chocolate, probably cheese. Cookie yeah, cookies. lots of chocolate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where did Where did you go? It, like specifically? Uh, a few different places. Oh. <laughs> they sound great. <laughs> <laughs> did you go to Bern? I've been to Bern. I don't think I did go to Bern. Mm. I was very young. Is that I where didn't... they got rid of all the books? Oh, my <laughs> Sorry, God. Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant. That was worth it. In the Bern, there's a lots of, like, bears, because bear, a bear is the is the symbol of the city of Bern. Oh. Uh, and the Appenzell Canton flag, um, so the, the area of, of Switzerland called Appenzell, has a flag which is a bear with an erection. Hmm. Crikey. Yeah. Um, so if you look at it, it's, it's a, only a tiny little red triangle. Um, if you can imagine a bear rampant, yeah. uh, and then you've got a little red triangle where his penis would be. Mm. And there was a, a time when St. Gallen, this was in 1579. Um, so the canton of St. Gallen had a printer and he did a calendar <laughs> of all the Swiss cantons. Yeah. And he did the Appenzel canton flag, but he didn't put the erection in the bear. Oh. And this was, it kicked off. Really? It really, really kicked off. They oh. almost went to war because they didn't have the penis on the bear. Uh, and then oh. wow. it, it was only averted when the printer offered abject apologies and St. Gallen agreed to destroy every single copy of the calendar they could find. Wow. Again, lots of rounding things up and destroying them. Yeah. yeah. It's a very spicy time. No wonder Switzerland is so determinedly neutral and calm today. Yeah. They've been through all like of their they're very For a very like organised country, they've got a really chaotic origin story. But I think yeah. they've got it all out of their system. They must have yeah. decided, I think, at a certain point, no, we, we, we <laughs> stop yeah. rounding up and destroying um, <laughs> calendars and things like that. <laughs> Stop the podcast! Stop the podcast! Hello, everybody. Just to let you know, we are sponsored this week by Babbel. That's right. Are you thinking of learning a new language, going away on a holiday, and don't want to be one of those tourists who knows just English? You can head to Babbel and you can change all that. You can find yourself fluent in multiple languages, depending, of course, on your study levels, as quick as, uh, I'm going to say, <laughs> six weeks. Six weeks you can do it. That's 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 <laughs> me saying that, not the site. Uh, but it's, it's an amazing place. There are 14 different languages that you can look into. There's Spanish, there's French, Italian, German. Uh, but the difference here is that it's not just an app that shows you words. These are things that are curated by language experts, 150 of them globally. You genuinely feel like you're getting to grips with a new language. Maybe you're dusting off an old language. Uh, the lessons are interactive. They are really fun. And there's also speech recognition technology, which helps you improve even your pronunciation and accent so you genuinely do get your hand held very nicely along the way uh, there are lots of different ways to learn there are podcasts there are games there are videos there are all sorts of methods so it's really highly recommended and if you want to get three months for free with the purchase of a three-month subscription all you need to do is go to babble b-a-b-b-e-l dot com forward slash podcast 23 because that's the year you put in the offer code no fish and you will get an extra three months for free do it now that's right. So head to babbel.com. That's B A B B E L dot com slash podcast 23 and use the promo code NOFISH. And what you're going to get with that is three months free with a purchase of a three month subscription. All right. On with the show. On with the show. Okay, it's time for our final fact of the show, and that is my fact. My fact this week is that to make sure that no one leaked the answer to who shot JR on the TV show Dallas, the production team had every main character film a scene of them shooting JR, including JR. 
<laughs> it's an amazing thing. So this is... We need to explain what Dallas is. Exactly. Yes. So Dallas was a soap opera in America, went on for a very long time. Uh, in the 1980s, it began. And it was a show that kind of really transformed the idea of soap having um, these dramatic plot twists and like also cliffhangers, cliffhangers and yeah. so on and it created the greatest cliffhanger probably in tv history certainly yeah. american tv it, history it's a, and it's about like a it follows like the escapades of like a wealthy oil tycoon's family yes. in dallas it's texas a, it's basically it's like succession. Succession. early cheesy succession really it is. Yeah. it's about yeah. squillionaires and yeah. the main character is an anti-hero just yeah. like logan yeah. roy yeah. i do think that succession is a very original idea and they definitely didn't rip off dallas in any way whatsoever just as an alternate I, opinion I, i'm not so sure i think uh <laughs> 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 but so yeah it's a, it's at the end of this third series it's the finale and jr who is the character played by larry hagman is shot we don't know who's pulled the trigger mm. and then there's a big break in the season and in that time america goes slightly ballistic we're trying to work out <laughs> the world almost yeah yeah yeah, yeah. who shot jr was basically the big question that everyone <laughs> with t-shirts next to the i'm with discount uh, yeah. who shot jr politicians it, were referencing it yeah, yeah, yeah everyone yeah. um and just a spoiler alert it was Kristen. There we go. What? Uh, <laughs> but the thing is, they the shooting of JR, this this huge event, maybe the biggest event in fictional TV history, yeah, was not meant to be the end of the series. They had already filmed an ending of the series, yeah, and they'd had a load of events. They'd had a deathbed murder confession. They'd had a sectioning. They had all sorts of you know, really crazy written themselves into a corner. Kind yeah, of thing. and yeah. then they got told, "Hey, great news! You got four more episodes." <laughs> <laughs> they had to write four more episodes, and and then there was a, there was a big head scratching thing in the writers' room, and someone said, "Why don't we just shoot the bastard?" Yeah. And then they, and they, they all because apparently of... a lot of the writers were comedians oh, or really? funny people really? at least, yeah. Huh. And um, this was I read this in an interview with Lorraine Desprez, who was one of the main writers. Uh, and yeah, she said that these were really funny guys who were trying to come up with ideas. And almost let's shoot Jr. was one person going, "Wouldn't it be funny if we did that? Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't it fuck things up if we did that?" And then they all went, "Oh, actually, that second. would be good." Yeah. Well, that's I mean, um, a lot of the writers of Succession are very funny comic writers. Yeah. Jesse yeah, Armstrong. Yeah. Yeah. Lucy Preble, Preble, yeah. Preble, yeah. Preble sorry. Oh, um, so you know, it's another link, uh, <laughs> another link between the two, I'd say. But you no, know, I mean, the world went crackers, didn't it? It, it did. Really nice. If you were on a plane going from Europe to America at the time, if it was an Air France plane, they said that they would tell anyone over the intercom who'd shot Jr. Because if you couldn't watch the show, yeah, yeah, yeah. They would, someone would radio up from the ground and say the it was Kristen, and then they'd go. <laughs> We're flying at 40,000 feet and it was Kristen who shot JR. <laughs> oh my Isn't God. Isn't that amazing? That's, but in, that is a huge spoiler. Is, there's no way of avoiding but, a yeah. plain Tannoy spoiler. That's yeah. true, although in those days you couldn't watch things on demand. Like yeah. you could have VHS'd yeah. it or maybe. So you maybe. actually kind of wanted to like, have things spoiled more. Actually, yeah, yeah. even in 1980, I guess you would have had VHS's, but only just. Yeah. Right. So, you know, it, you had to watch it live. Yeah, if you exactly. didn't watch it live, yeah. you were not going to watch exactly. it. Exactly, you well, weren't going to know. The, the Turkish parliament suspended a session <laughs> so that so that the legislators wouldn't would, would be able to tune in and wouldn't miss it like yeah. really is. there was a, a really fantastic piece in texas monthly which oh, yeah. if anyone's going to cover who shot yeah. JR, the Bureau, <laughs> front like, page surely absolutely yeah. but no there is an amazing piece which is all about the the, the madness that happened um so uh they, they shot at a real ranch uh, you know they shot some scenes at a real ranch yeah it was mm. just shot in interior sets in in hollywood but um the son of the guy who lived at the ranch they shot at was uh, is called Joe Duncan, and he says that they had people turning up to take chips of the fence, take oh pieces God. of rock. You know, they could have taken a chip of the fence and used it as a tiny fence <laughs> <laughs> in a model railway. <laughs> <laughs> that's like um relics that's mad yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. he said listen to this quote he said i was once 20 feet away from a guy who jumped the fence and went out into the pasture to pick up a piece of horse manure to take <laughs> home as a souvenir really? and that wow. was a time before ebay <laughs> yeah his well. name was dad Schreiber. <laughs> uh, i read an article from this was the day before they were about to show the who shot jr and this was in the minneapolis star and they asked some local celebs who they thought had shot jr okay. and like the head of the coach of one of the local sports teams said oh, i don't know who shot jr but there's a lot of agents of players who i'd like to shoot 
The police chief, who's called Anthony Boozer, he said, I'm happy to report that I've never seen a single minute of that goddamn program. Wow. And they asked the mayor, Don Fraser, this is the mayor of Minneapolis, and he said, I haven't the foggiest who shot him. Are you serious? I've only seen one episode of that show, and it was quite by accident. Oh, wow. Okay. Sounds like a lifelong fan. <laughs> I just can't believe they asked him. Like, they asked someone, and they got these answers, and they thought, well, we might as well print that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> the thing that I knew Dallas for, because I'd never really seen it, yeah. but I, I know it as a famous, like a famous example of retconning. Uh, where you retroactively change oh, yeah, yeah. what happens. So oh, um, yeah, they yeah. wrote, filmed, and shot and broadcast an entire season in which a character, Bobby Ewing, died. But this character was really popular and they decided they wanted to bring him back. So in order to do that, they retconned it by at the beginning of the next series, they they made the whole previous series a dream sequence. Of oh, all the other yeah, characters, yeah. Which, yeah. which is hailed as one of the like the cheesiest, most rubbish ways of like retconning. Um, yeah. But it, one of the, the weird continuity things was that um, <laughs> Dallas had a spin-off show called Knott's Landing that existed in the same universe okay but when they brought back bobby ewing and was like oh this character never died in knots landing they had referenced the fact that bobby had died so at that point it's like a, a universe <laughs> splintering well, moment it's, it's like <laughs> spider verse into the it multiverse is, yeah. Yeah. yeah but, but exactly. they were simultaneously taking into a like they were like keeping track of the different universes while simultaneously wiping entire series off the face of the earth you would think it would be easier to say Oh, he didn't die. He faked his own death, or yes, exactly. as in, unless they showed on camera the funeral, the like open yeah. casket. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I think casket. it was like the main part of a lot of the story of that. They, season. they literally right. were like, forget that series happened. It's weird. Yeah, there was um, there was a real life Bobby Ewing who lived in Texas and who owned an oil and cattle company. Oh, really? Yeah. And so when this big sort of who shot JR thing was happening, they really kind of cashed in and you could buy JR dolls, JR cologne, JR playing cards. Um, and you could also buy fake certificates for Ewing Land Oil and Cattle Company, ah. which was signed by Bobby Ewing, the fake Bobby Ewing. Oh. But then the real Bobby Ewing, who lived in Texas, sued yeah. them and said, well, you can't do this because yeah. yeah. like, it makes it look like you're selling my company. And I found out that it was settled in the end and the real Bobby Ewing <laughs> wasn't allowed to sell any novelty items. Uh, and it didn't say, but I assume he got a massive you know, payout. Yeah, yeah. He must have done, right? Yeah. Um, amazing. Larry Hagman, yeah. who played JR. JR. So obviously there's a big break for the, you know, when they're not shooting. Yeah. He hadn't signed his contract when they started shooting the next series, and he held out for a long time. Mm. And he he because he knows he's a star now, right? Yeah. Everyone's talking about he him. Wanted yeah. a, he wanted a huge pay rise. Um, mm. He dispatched his agents to negotiate wearing white stetson hats with the uh, the management. Of <laughs> and the that show. was his kind of that was look, his look. Right? Sorry, yeah, yeah that was okay. his thing. Yeah, but oh, they I'd feel really stupid if I was his agent and I was told to do that. I, yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> they were like, "You're overreaching with it this was, negotiation," and was, you want us to go in fancy dress. It was worse <laughs> when Mr. Blobby asked for a pay rise. <laughs> <laughs> you would come in and be like, ah, Mr. Blobby. Like, ah, <laughs> when they were sh when they were trying to shoot the next series, they yeah. had to start shooting, but without Jr. being present and oh, having signed right. off his contract, you know, without having signed his contract. Mm, yeah. So what they started doing, they sh they shot a couple of different versions. One, they just shot Jr. from behind. Mm, they just brilliant. shot someone with the same hair, which they, you know, they could just like fill in later. Yeah. And then they also shot scenes with a guy bandaged up, like he'd be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and they said if we have to bring in another actor to play JR we can claim you had to have reconstructive surgery and now you look like a different <laughs> so guy funny. the Amazing. problem is JR was shot in the stomach <laughs> <laughs> no reason yeah. that's great Hagman what an interesting kind of personality he was mm. generally he used to do a thing for many many years um, called Silent Sundays he just didn't talk on Sundays. So no. funny. Yeah. He. So what happened was a is religious, that religious thing. Or? <laughs> no, no. It was part of. He used to be on a different show called I Dream a Genie, brilliant show. And um, well, during it, he had vocal problems, and so he went to a doctor, and the doctor said, "Why don't you try not talking for a few days?" And he thought not only did it work nicely, but he really enjoyed the experience. So every Sunday, he thought, "I'm just going to do this," wow. and didn't speak for decades. That's so good. Yeah. Wow. I, yeah. He claimed that for 25 years, he never spoke on a Sunday. 
I, I think it's not 100% true. I think he kind of cheated a fair amount, but... Because it's, it's Sunday's yeah. your birthday or... Yeah. Tread on some Lego. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah. Sometimes yeah. he would go like four days in a row without talking, wouldn't wow. he? And his family would hate him for it. And oh, so really? He kicked it because he, uh, he says that he started realizing he was missing a lot of opportunities because he says in LA, a lot of business is done on the weekends. <laughs> and so he said he couldn't call his agent. He couldn't talk to them to say, hey, get on the case of doing this. Or... <laughs> it was incredibly good negotiation negotiating to stay silent he probably should have it done is. all his business on a sunday it's just a... sit there in silence while they just keep upping the offer <laughs> until like the clock goes over to monday and he's like yeah great <laughs> that's so funny a nazi who's a fan of dallas great was it, um Rud it, Rud Rudolf it's herman Gerd. no it was oh. rudolf hess yeah. rudolf hess the nazi um no, <laughs> 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 did um, we cover another person who there was another there was genuinely was there? another rudolf hess <laughs> really Oh, he was called Rudolf Haas, the avocado, oh, the avocado, avocado guy. guy. Yes. So unfortunate. <laughs> the guy behind the Haas avocado was called Rudolf Haas. Wow. Yeah. Um, um, well, this, this one was the, the Nazi, the Nazi and presumably train enthusiast. Um, was he still alive when he watched Dallas Spandau Prison? He used to watch it in oh. he used to, Dallas and Dynasty were his two favorite TV shows. Mm. That he watched. Oh. Okay. Did he? So they weren't all bad. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is retconning, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's it. That is all of our facts. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to get in contact with any of us about the things that we've said over the course of this podcast, we can be found on our Twitter accounts. I am on at Schreiberland. Andy. At Andrew Hunter M. James. At James Harkin. And Alex. Oh, I've quit Twitter. Are you on, are you on Insta? Uh, no. Um, are you on anything? Are you on Be Real? Be Real, no. <laughs> that's good, that one. I'm still on Bebo. So, yeah. Are you on Mastodon? <laughs> no, <laughs> don't be disgusting. That sounds horrible. What is that? <laughs> Mafia based porn site. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, or you can email us at podcast at qi.com or you can go to our website, no such thing as a fish.com. All of our previous episodes are up there. Do check them out. Uh, we'll be back again next week with another episode. We will see you then. Goodbye. Goodbye.